In 1977, in the small town of Tyler, Texas, 22-year-old Linda Jo Edwards was attacked and murdered. Her assault was especially brutal. I'm your host, Leah. Phil here. And I'm Steve. Today we'll talk to the man that was found guilty of that murder and spent 20 years on death row before he was found to be wrongfully convicted. If you have an appetite for the strange and bizarre, then pull up a chair and grab a spoon for another intriguing serving of Remnant Stew. Remnant Stew is gluten-free, organic, made from all natural, free-range ingredients and guaranteed to provide the recommended daily serving of curiosity. Hello and welcome to another episode of Remnant Stew. This episode is quite a bit different from any that we've done before. That's right. We pride ourselves on being a family-friendly show, but in these next two episodes titled Carrie Cook, we will be discussing some topics that involve extreme violence and other matters of an adult nature. Listener discretion is strongly advised. With that said, let me set up the crime. Quoting from a 2016 article by Michael Hall for Texas Monthly Magazine, quote, On the morning of June 10, 1977, Linda Jo Edwards was found brutally murdered in her Tyler, Texas apartment. It was a horrifying scene. The 22-year-old, naked from the waist down, had been stabbed more than 20 times in her face, neck, and chest and pubic areas. Her mouth had been slit and part of, parts of her body seemed to be missing. A piece of her lower lip, sections of her vaginal wall. It was one of the most heinous crimes in Smith County history. On Saturday, August 13, 2022, in our studio here, we interviewed Carrie Max Cook and his wife, Sandra. We were hoping to get at least an hour's worth of information, but we wound up getting more than three and a half hours worth. We're going to be presenting this to you in two separate episodes. Most of the information will be presented to you here as we recorded it live that day. However, in the interest of brevity, we will be summarizing some parts of the interview. Well, today at Remnant Stew, we're very honored and excited to have Carrie Max Cook and his wife Sandy sitting in the studio with us. Hello, Carrie. Hello, Sandy. Hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. Now, Carrie and I met many, many years ago under unusual circumstances when I was a teacher in the Texas Department of Corrections. In fact, uh, I uh, helped Carrie get complete his high school diploma when he when uh, he was uh, incarcerated in uh, the Texas prison system. Um, I'll just tell you that. Uh, my experience was that many times I would meet inmates and they would always have a story they wanted to tell me, you know, and I would listen. But there was always something different about your story. You know, that I felt like, yeah, he's not just trying to give me the runaround. There's something really that rings true about this particular story. So, Carrie, why don't, let's take us back. Talk to us a little bit about your, first of all, your family, your childhood. Where did you grow up? And tell us about your, your parents and your your siblings. Okay. Um Blake, uh, great to be here, Steve, uh, with you again, as always. We had a lot more hair back then. Yes, exactly. And, can, and less weight. <laughs> a lot less weight. Uh, anyway, my, my dad uh, my dad was in the U.S. Army. For, for uh, He graduated high school in small town Jacksonville, and uh, his grandmother s- signed the waiver for him to go into the military. I think he was 17. Okay. And uh, the next 28 years, my dad served uh, his country. Right. And... Uh, I was born in Stuttgart, Germany, okay. uh, actually on a U.S. Army base. And what year were you born? I was born April fifth, nineteen fifty six, at, uh, at the Fifth General Hospital in Stuttgart, Germany. Okay. And I spent my first fourteen years uh, growing uh, overseas in, in Germany, France, and Belgium, where wherever my dad was stationed. Military bases, right? Yes, yeah. my I had an older brother. His name was Dawayne. He was two years older than me. Right. Um, because we lived uh, overseas, there was there was rarely any uh, uh, room at the BOQs on base for, right. for dependents. So we lived in these rural areas of of, yeah. of Belgium, Germany, and so forth. And that made my older brother uh, my best friend. We're the only one who spoke English. Right. And so you're we, very close to your brother. We, <laughs> he was, you know, like I like to say, if there's any such thing as one person being in everything, yeah. Doyle Wang was in everything to me. We were... We were extremely close. Right. Yes. 
So then your dad's discharged, and so your family moves back to, to Jacksonville, is that right? That's where my mom Jacksonville, and dad... Jacksonville, Texas, we're saying, yes. yeah. That's where my mom and dad were from, and they moved us to uh, the small town of Jacksonville, Texas, in East, in East, in Texas, East, yeah. in East Texas, uh, home of the Piney Woods. All right. So then what was life like for you uh, as a teenagers explored the world in uh, military bases, and then you're, you're plopped down in a, in a small rural East Texas town? He took the words right out of my mouth. He must have got that from the Ellis Two unit. I don't know, but uh, it was it was traumatic after having been, you know, raised overseas on U.S. Army bases or right. and, and in rural communities, Belgium, France. My dad had a top secret security clearance, shaped Belgium, a Supreme Allied, I mean, Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, right. and uh, uh, we. Uh, uh, well, uh, I've been to Paris, France. Right. I've climbed the Eif- Eiffel Tower as a kid. Yeah. And so we never were just, you know, uh, stationary. We're always. We're I've moving, gone. Yeah. The, I've gone to Decal. I've seen the yeah. the ovens and so forth. So my 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 childhood was always full of education, field trips, and yeah. and so forth. So moving to Jacksonville was, uh, frankly, it was very traumatic because right. it was a town that was so small. Uh, you could, you know, basically throw one rock to the other other end of it. Post mm-hmm. office, piggly wiggly, yeah. more churches than people. Yeah. And uh mm-hmm. it was uh it was it was very, very difficult. Kerry detailed the culture shock he felt when his family moved to his parents' original hometown, the small East Texas farming community of Jacksonville. He felt out of place and soon fell in with the wrong crowd and started getting into trouble, stealing cars and using drugs. At age 17, he was kicked out of school, and he was tried as an adult for car theft and drug possession. He was sent to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Ferguson Unit for four months until he turned 18 when he was released. While in prison, he was raped by his cellmate, who was a gang member. His determination not to get into trouble after he was released didn't stick, as he soon was hanging with the same crowd doing more stupid things. This caused him to be well-known by the Jacksonville Police Department. He became suspect any time a crime was committed in the area. When we moved to Jacksonville, and I, I enrolled in Jacksonville High School, um, Steve, I mean, I, I can't, uh, I felt like Buck Rogers in the 21st century. This, <laughs> this was really odd. Uh, I was raised very strict. You know, you right. say yes, sir, and no, ma'am, and uh, there were no drugs, you know, uh, the big deal in Germany was getting caught smoking a cigarette in the bathroom. Right. Here in Colleen, Te- I mean, in Jacksonville, Texas, they were smoking marijuana and they were really? passing acid tablets and so forth. In Jacksonville, Texas. Yes. In 1972. No, this is, uh, yeah, 72. Se- yeah. Right in there, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it was, uh, and they were wearing military jackets, army military jackets. That's something I really respected was the military. So yeah. making fun of wearing military jackets was like yeah. offensive to me. Because of the soldiers, right. uh, they were like we were one big family overseas. So, right. um, uh, I uh, I was ostracized. I was bullied a lot. Mm-hmm. I was always a kind of a soft spoken kid, kind of timid, yeah. you know. But but the class clown, I was right. trying to make people laugh. You yeah. know, that was my personality. But I was kind of timid, and that attracted uh, the wrong crowd. I was, you know, I I I, yeah. I, I got in fights where it was one sided. Yeah. I'm getting my butt kicked and yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway I that gravi- I gravitated towards the only people that I could make friends with and there were these two brothers um Larry Taylor and his younger brother mm-hmm. uh we uh uh, uh took a car in the in, in the parking lot of the Jacksonville yeah. High School uh or it might have been some an MGM a little small car it was a walking had the keys still in it. Always had to have the key. Have to have the keys in it. And people often left the keys in the cars in those days in rural and, areas. So. And we left. And here's the comical thing about it. I think I put it in my book like this, or I've certainly told audiences this story around the world because I remember like it was yesterday. I couldn't drive, and Larry Taylor couldn't drive. He was my size and everything, mm-hmm. but he couldn't drive. Well, we brought his younger brother with us, and he was like, and maybe fifth grade or something <laughs> and he was really small so what we did we put all of our school books together and then stopped at a couple of those old timey uh Ma Bell telephone booths yeah. ripped out the telephone books they were that big yeah and we put a couple of those on top of each other because he said he could drive okay <laughs> and so the, he we put him on there and he could see over the dashboard and we made it all the way to 
clean Texas. We drove yeah. on. We drove on base. Yeah. We drove on base, and this is how we. This is how it all came to a, a, an end. Um, we're at a red light, and this MP pulls up right beside of us. Mm-hmm. He looks here. We look at him. I look forward, and all of a sudden, the blue police lights of the uh-huh. jeep come on, and that's how we ended up getting uh, <laughs> arrested. But what it went from bad to worse because I didn't know any better. I was just this uh, young, stupid kid who didn't understand consequences at that right. age uh and so they put me in a jail cell uh uh and i'm really small and thin and there's this much room at the top the mm-hmm. bars yeah and there's this much room at the top i climbed up through there and ran you got out of the jail cell so i got out. accused of escaping you know <laughs> so, so that got me one heck of a reputation by the time I got back to Jacksonville. I, I mean, uh, I'm driving around with these girls one night. One of them in the back window throws a beer can out. A DPS officer named Tom Ball mm-hmm. pulls us over, and he knows the can came out of the back seat right. uh, of, of the dro- of the passenger. Right. I'm in the front seat, and my friend's driving. So he says, he, uh, who threw the beer can out? And no one's admitting to it. Mm-hmm. And so he says, do I have to take you all to jail then? And uh, I said, ah, I did it. He yeah. said, it didn't come from your, uh, from the, but okay, you did. <laughs> yeah. So I went, I went back to jail. You well, took it for somebody else. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I didn't go back to jail, but I got a big, heavy fine for lo- uh, littering. Yeah. And it was more than I thought it was. It was over $200. Yeah. And I couldn't pay it. And I was already way behind on my probation fees. Mm-hmm. This is how I ended up at Rust State Hospital. My probation officer. This is the record. It's yeah. it's it's in a file. Right. It, it, this is not me saying it. I'm just reciting the record. He says uh, he takes me to Rust State Hospital. And says Carrie, you got way too much stress. He said you you need a break. He said I'm going to take you to Rust State Hospital. You need to talk to somebody. Yeah. And as the admission, what it says, it says. He's being harassed by Jacksonville Police Department. Mm-hmm. He's not a bad kid. He's just being harassed. He needs to talk to somebody. Yeah. So that's how I first go to Rust State Hospital, which later gets used as he's dangerous. He's mentally ill. I mean, yeah. that's how that first happens. Right. Where, where Jerry Landrum, that guy, his evaluation is a troubled youth, uh, 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 likely to vent his anger and frustration out on some property, but Venting his anger and frustration against human humans is extremely unlikely. Right. That was yeah. his findings. So anyway, um, uh, I, I get in trouble. Uh, they're going to revoke my probation. Um, I run. Yeah, I run. I run away for the. Uh, I run for the next uh, couple of years. After several more bouts of getting into trouble, his probation officer sent Carrie to Rusk State Hospital. While there, a psychiatrist named Landry wrote that Kerry was a troubled teen trying to find his way. He might act out against property, but not against people. Parts of this evaluation were later used against him at his murder trial. After being released from Rusk, Kerry wound up in Dallas and found employment at a nightclub called The Old Plantation. Long story short, I wind up in this bar um, called The Old Plantation. Uh, it was a unisex bar. It was uh, gay, lesbian, and, and just yeah. straight people, but it was all of it rolled into one. I met this bartender guy. I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't have a home, no money. And uh, so anyway, he got me a job at the old plantation mm-hmm. as, a, as a bar back. I worked my way up from a bar back to a bartender. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was making really good money, so much that I got my own apartment, uh, the uh, Spanish Villa Apartments on Lemon Avenue in Dallas, Texas. In Dallas, okay. I remember that like it was yesterday. Uh, that was the name of it, Spanish Villa Apartments. And uh, I got my own apartment and was doing really well. I was doing so well mm-hmm. that I thought to myself, this is not who I want to be. I don't want to look over my shoulder the rest of my life. Yeah. So uh, I just, I quit, I quit my job and uh, I take what I can and I, uh, I, I, I go to, I, I get a, I, I buy a Greyhound bus mm-hmm. or Continental Trailways. It was one of the two. And I went to, it went to Tyler, Texas. And from there, I was going to switch buses and go on to Jacksonville. Right. Where I get to Tyler that day, that late that after around five o'clock. And no, there's no buses until tomorrow to right. Jacksonville. So, you know, I have no money, you know, uh, so I start hitchhiking. Mm-hmm. And this is when this guy, James Taylor picks me up, right. uh, hitchhiking by the Embarcadero apartment complex. And long story short, uh, I'm telling him, I tell him I'm going to turn myself in. I'd 
violated probation. I want to be free from it. Mm-hmm. I want to face the music. I want to do what I have to do. Right. And uh, for a long story short, I, I, I go to, uh, I end up staying with him for a couple of days or a while. And then I go back to, I go to Jacksonville. And lo and behold, the lawyer, Leland Reinhardt, that's his name. Uh-huh. Uh, I think he's just court appointed. He finds out that uh, the indictment for the malicious mischief, where they dropped it from burglary for kicking the windows out to malicious mischief, that the the state had failed to put at the indictment against the peace and dignity of the state, mm-hmm. and that made it a faulty indictment. Every indictment has to uh. say against the peace and dignity of the state, and it it missed that. And right. then you, they use that technicality to say carry. You're free. No probation. No probation fees. You're free. So for the first time since moving to Jacksonville or moving right. to the United States, I was finally free and clear. And then I get arrested for the capital murder of Linda Edwards. Tyler is a larger town near Jacksonville. Kerry wound up staying at an apartment of an acquaintance while he looked for work. This is where he meets Linda Jo Edwards. I had nowhere to go, so I went back to James, I, uh, called James Taylor. He picked me up yeah. at the Cherokee County Jail, and I went back to Tyler, his apartment. Right. Um, he was uh, uh, he delivered oil well parts, right. and uh, he was gone a lot, so it was it was kind of perfect. Uh, I'd hang out at the swimming pool. Uh, I was looking for a job. I'd put in a few applications. I'd lost my driver's license, right. so I'd gone to the DPS to get a duplicate driver's license. Well. One of the days in early June uh, would later be determined had to be a Monday, uh, three days before, because Linda had put in to be off. And I always said it was early uh, June, right. uh, uh, June, June 6th, I believe. Uh, that, well, first, I got to back up. I was walking to the pool uh, one day from the sidewalk and um, I saw the, 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 the blinds were wide open mm-hmm. and uh, uh, there was this woman that was nude and it was pretty clear I mean, from the sidewalk. You can see it clear. So I looked over there and, you know, I, I, I saw it for a second. I froze and uh, I looked right and left because I didn't, I was wondering if someone could see me staring because I was embarrassed and I didn't want to look like a pervert. Right. So I looked right and I looked left to see if anyone else was looking at me, looking in this window. And she was a tall, uh, a, a large woman. And so, um, uh, and then by the time I looked back, there she's staring at me and I go, Oh, and I'm I'm embarrassed. Mm-hmm. You know, I was a I was a different kind of kid. I was yeah. young for my age, yeah. and so uh, sh- kind of a sheltered life overseas, not a f- life in the fast lane. Yeah. Uh, despite stealing the cars with the kids running away from home, <laughs> right? Um, different kind of fast lane. A different kind of fast yeah. lane. And so uh, 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 a few days go by. Um, I'm out at the swimming pool, and there she is. She's reading a book or something in a lawn chair. Mm-hmm. I walk up to her. Uh, I start talking to her. I tell her that uh, uh, I work at a rock and roll club in Dallas, Texas. Mm-hmm. And uh, I tell her I meet Joan Jett in the Black Hearts, which is all all true. But mm-hmm. the part I didn't tell her is that the club was a gay club, yeah. you know, the old plantation. Yeah. And so it's it's like uh, what would later become known as one of the hottest days on record uh, for, for Tyler at that time. So we, we talk for a while and... Uh, uh, she invites me back to her apartment. Says, Let's go have a drink. And so, so this is June of what year now? We're talking 1977. 1977, June 1977. So you, you meet her at the pool. You come and back we to end her up going back to her drink. apartment. And uh, uh, she 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 put some passion marks on my neck. Yeah. And don't think nothing about it. Short while later, I leave through the patio door. That's how my fingerprint obviously got yeah. there. We we entered through the patio door. Yeah. And so. Um, uh, I leave. I tell her I meet her back at the pool. It kind of made me uh, nervous, you know. So I she went was pretty forward then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was a little sh- shy. Okay. And, yeah. and let's let's just take a moment. This is Linda Jo Edwards. Yeah. Linda jo Edwards. Yes. About. Yes. Okay. So I go back out to the the pool. She was she was a gorgeous, tall, beautiful woman. Yeah. She was twenty one, and she was just lovely. In the April fifth, twenty sixteen oh, Mayfield man. interview, yeah, he mentioned that he he said Linda was very free that way, and that they were always telling her close the blinds, and right. she just left them open. It was you know it was just something that she did, and I think Carrie's point is that she wasn't she wasn't doing anything wrong. She, but I wasn't this, either hold looking. On, hold on, yeah, no, yeah, this this isn't a, a slut shaming. She was a beautiful girl, right? Of course, and she not. was just very free. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. But they turned it into something ugly Perverse. and disgusting Perverse. that he did it when lots of other people right. were doing it. They weren't wrong. She but I was wrong. a suspect. They were taking the trial, so I yeah. had to be the pervert. Yes. So let's move on. Then you you left the apartment that day. Maybe maybe you saw around the pool, pool again. Did you no, see any more? No, no, I didn't see her again. But I had passion marks yeah. on my neck. Yeah. And James Taylor had these uh, two nephews, Randy and Rodney Dykes, and it was this other guy, his gay best friend named Robert Hahn, and uh, they would come over. James Taylor was gone, uh, delivering oil well parts in yeah. Louisiana, and they said. Uh, uh, this is the record. They said to me, uh, hey, man, you got lucky, huh? And I said, what do you mean? Because I hadn't even seen them yet. Uh-huh. He said, you got you got hickeys on on your neck. I said, really? You know, he, he said, where'd you get those? I said, man, that girl I met, uh, I saw naked in the window. I met her at the pool. Mm-hmm. I went back to her apartment with her. Man, she gave me these passion, these hick, these hickeys. Yeah. Didn't call them passion. For kids, when I'm talking right, to yeah. teen audiences, I used they're... the term passion marks, but... Yeah. I called them hickeys back then yeah. to them. And so, lo and behold, to me, this is reason it's said to be the worst case in American history of police and prosecutorial misconduct is because this is just one example of a hundred. Um, they, 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 these, these witnesses, Robert Hahn, mm-hmm. Randy Dykes, Rodney Dykes, told the police department, signed sworn statements. Yeah. He knows her. She invited him back to her apartment. He called her by, oh, I even called her by name. This is, uh, before I'm arrested, yeah. I said, that girl, her name's Linda. She gave them to me. And so Robert Hahn tells the grand jury that I knew her. I'd been back yeah. to her apartment. He called her by name. He pointed out the window where she lives to me. And then Robert uh, Randy Dykes uh, says, yeah, he met her. He said she had big boobs. He, he met her. At the, he went back to her apartment. Mm-hmm. Rodney does the same thing. They say the grand. They tell the grand jury. Right. All that suppressed. The prosecution goes at the seventy-eight trial. Stranger on stranger, lust murder by a homosexual pervert. Mm-hmm. Says that uh, uh, I never knew her. They suppressed any right. evidence that I knew her, including the sworn statements. Kerry is referring ahead to the court case, but we'll go back to his arrest and what led up to it. Carrie first noticed Linda Edwards through her apartment window. He was walking by when he was shocked and probably, as a young man, delighted (laughs) to see a young lady walking around her apartment completely naked, but with the curtains wide open. An attractive young lady. That's right. She was absolutely beautiful. Later, he saw her at the local pool and struck up a friendship. Carrie then visited Linda at her apartment on June 6, 1977. Carrie left that night by the sliding glass door of Linda's apartment, where he left his fingerprints. Linda Jo Edwards was raped and murdered sometime near midnight on June 9th and 10th, 1977. So three days later, right. three, yeah, um, after she had met with Carrie. Quoting again from the Michael Hall article in Texas Monthly, quote, there were no signs of forced entry, a signal to investigators that someone Edwards knew probably committed the crime. Her roommate, Paula Rudolph, told police that a man had been in Edwards' room late that night, and though she didn't get a good look at him, she assumed it was Edwards' boyfriend, 44-year-old James Mayfield. The man she glimpsed had medium-length silver white, silver hair and white shorts. Mayfield had medium-length silver hair and, being a tennis buff, was known to wear white shorts much, much of the time. Mayfield, aware that he could be a suspect, came to the police station later that day to tell his story. Yes, the father of three had been having an affair with Edwards. He had been the head librarian at Texas Eastern University and had hired her. They'd been seeing each other for a year and a half, but he swore it had ended three weeks before. More importantly, he had an alibi for the previous evening. He said that he had been home with his wife, Elfried, and his daughter, Luella. The police questioned Luella and cleared Mayfield, end quote. It was later determined to be true that Mayfield had broken off the affair with Linda Jo Edwards, at which point she made some kind of suicide attempt. At that time, Mayfield asked another employee, Paula Rudolph, to take her in. The suicide attempt caused the affair to be known and Mayfield to be fired from his job. As Paula Rudolph said for a long time, she was certain it was Mayfield she saw that night. He was her boss and she knew well what he looked like. However, months later, after meeting several times with police, she would change her story and say it was Carrie Max Cook she saw that night. Carrie, at the time, had long uh, brown hair, dark brown hair, actually. 
He was yes. very, very angry. He told witnesses at the university, she ruined me. She ruined my career. And then he told another witness who caught, saw him with a U-Haul truck at a gas pump named John Sperger, who gave an affidavit. He, see, Spur, he sees him on his way out of town. Right. He says, hey, what, aren't you a suspect in, in Linda's murder? He said, yeah. And this is what Spur, John Spurgeon said. Mayfield told him, hey, you can get away with anything if you know the right people and yeah. you have enough money. Let's go back. Okay, so that was the 6th of June. So what happens then? Is it like three days later the actual murder takes place? Right? June 10th. June the 10th. All right, so you, you saw her that day on the uh, on the 6th of June. Yeah. So what did you do the rest of the week? Okay, the, the rest of the week, um, my brother, whom I was so close to, uh, mm -hmm. Live right down the road in Jacksonville. I didn't have any friends there. I didn't know anybody. Entirely. You know? Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and uh, 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 I, Randy Dykes came over uh, the, the, the morning of, of June 10th, that Friday, right? It's this mm -hmm. Friday. He came, he came over, opened the door. I, I crawled out of bed. I'm wearing the same thing I'm, I was wearing the night before. Yeah. Because uh, Robert Hawney come over. I'd had several beers with him and I, I passed out. So I'm wearing the same clothes. And he answers his door and he says, Hey, come on! I need your help. And I said, "Uh, what? What, what with? I said, I'm hungover, man. What do you What do you need?" He said, "My my mom's uh TV. I need to take it to Curtis Mathis and get it fixed. The picture tube's out." Mm. And so, uh, I I thought about it. I told him, "Yeah, I'll help." And I just remember that Curtis Mathis. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That just, came to me. that just came to me right now. That was, yeah, that was so, a TV brand back in the day. No, that was the TV that he said yeah. that he needed help with to take it to the Curtis Mathis store. Wow. Uh, and so I told him, yeah, let me get cleaned up some. And they came in, uh, him and his brother, Rodney, who was 13, 12, mm -hmm. came in. Uh, Randy was 18. And they come in. Uh, I'm, I'm washing my face, brushing my teeth, and uh, I changed clothes. And... I, and I go with him in his pickup truck to deliver the Curtis Mathis TV set. It's right. kind of heavy. Him and I, it's one of those big consoles. Yeah, like they great made big back one. Then. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it was heavy. And we dropped that off. And then I had to ask him, uh, would he mind taking me uh, to DPS? I'd lost my driver's license, right. you know. And to get a job, I was going to have to be able to show some ID. Yeah. So he takes me to, to the DPS office in Tyler, Texas. They take my photograph. They give me a piece of paper. That's that's my duplicate license right. until that one arrives. They get the address I give is uh whatever Bullard Road, the, the apartment in Barcadero, because yeah. I'm I'm looking for a job. Yeah. And uh, did you uh, drop off applications that morning? I dropped off applications. Uh, the uh, another one was to this uh my McAvoy something. I went and filled out an application, mm -hmm. and he says that he says filled out an application, and then at the end of that, I ask him. Uh, could he take me to Jacksonville so I could, you know, spend a weekend with my brother? Right. Uh, so this was Friday morning. He's taking you around. You're doing all the, this. Yeah. And then yeah. by now it's it's afternoon, and I say, can you yeah. take me to Jacksonville? Because I usually tried to get to yeah. Jacksonville to see my hang out with my brother. And so uh, I go. We go back to the apartment. Mm -hmm. I get a change of clothes, which is basically a brown paper bag because yeah. I don't have a suitcase. And uh, later the prosecution would would try to get him to say that. Uh, uh, I put a I put a cassette tape uh, in the bag too. It was a the Kansas Left Overture uh, eight track tape. Mm -hmm. I wanted Doyle Wayne to hear it because it was one of my favorites at the time. And uh, they would get Rodney Dykes to who you know admitted that he was pressured to to, to lie. He he said that uh, uh, the prosecution made it look like I had body parts in in that bag in the bag. Oh, yes, okay. yes, that I'd had body parts. And so he takes me to AMF in Jacksonville, drops me off uh, with his little paper bag. Which, and then uh, that's the last time I see him. Doyle Wayne t drives me back to, that Sunday evening. Doyle Wayne drives me back to Tyler. Mm -hmm. James Mayfield's there back from Louisiana. He was extremely possessive and jealous. He had heard that his friend Bob Hahn was over there, his best friend. And he said, you're, you're never going to like me like that. You're never going to like me like that. So you got to go. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. So he kicks me out, and I have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And so he drives me to Houston and drops me off at this bar. Kerry states that he was wearing the same clothes as the night before, no blood, and he had several witnesses and documentation asked to his movements the next morning, 
June 10, 1977, including going to the Department of Public Safety to get a replacement for his lost driver's license. Paula Rudolph originally stated that she was only nine feet from the person she saw in the apartment and described the suspect as having short gray hair. This information was left out of the affidavit for the arrest. She identified the man as her boss, James Mayfield. She was reported to have passed a polygraph concerning this information. However, by the time the trial came around, she was coerced to change it to Carrie Cook. She was overheard arguing with Michael Thompson, the district attorney, about it. Carrie details a bizarre event when she was forced to ride in the prison elevator at the jail with him. There's two elevators. There's the service elevator, uh, which went straight up to the jail. It was a jail elevator. Mm -hmm. And there was the public elevator. Inmates never co-mingled with the public and right. went in the public elevator. Yeah. And the jail elevator was dilapidated. It was old, rickety. It, yeah. it rocked back and forth. It was old. It was scary. Yeah. You know? So I go in there. The jailers put me in the elevator. A.D. Clark runs over there, the D.A., puts his arm in it, make it open back up. Hold on. We're coming. And he comes in with Paul Rudolph. And it's so small. The elevator is so small. Yeah. She's up against me. And she's going. And I'm like shaking like a leaf. What's going on here? As soon as I get back. I've... So, he, so he came in with the girl's roommate in the prison elevator with you? The jail elevator. The jail Smith, elevator. The Smith County jail elevator. And so as soon as I get back upstairs, you know, I'm telling the jailer, taking me back to my cell. I need to call my lawyer. I need to call my lawyer. I... So. A day goes by, I get to my lawyer, and they're listening. I said, you won't believe this. A.D. Clark put Paula Rudolph in the jail elevator with me. I don't know what that's going to mean. Yeah. What did it mean? She says now, and it's in the record, I saw him after one of the pretrial hearings. I was in the elevator with him. That's when I knew it was him. That's when A.D. Clark III convinced oh, yeah. her and Michael Thompson, yeah. you have to say it's Cook now. I see. Wow. But there's a little more wow. to it. There's a little more to it. Even more incriminating. As to, as to why Paula Rudolph identified, me. changed her testimony from Mayfield from to me. Mayfield to changed her statements to now it's Carrie Cook, and okay, I know he has long brown curly hair to his shoulders, but the light cut the hair and it made it look silver. So tell us when was the first time you heard about this murder that took place? Okay. I called James Taylor from, from, from Houston, Texas, and I asked him, I said, has my driver's license arrived yet? You know, because that's the address I gave. Yeah. And he says, no. But he says, Carrie, you've been in trouble. Stay away. He said, he said, the cops are everywhere. He said, this girl was murdered right down the, from my apartment. Her name, her name Linda Edwards. He said, uh, the cops are all over investigating. If you, he said, don't come back. I'll send it to you when you get, when I get it, because, You'll be their suspect because your your background right. being in trouble. So I said I said to him I said James, um, you sure I don't need to come back because uh, uh, I I can come back. I want I want them to do whatever they have to do. He says no no no. He says don't worry it's already over. He says it's already over. I'm just telling you don't come back. I'll send it to you. Right. And that's the last time I hear from him. And that's when I hear about the first time I hear about. Uh, Linda Edwards. So that's the murder. first time you heard about the murder. But you I don't were in know Houston. that's yeah. her. Yeah, I don't know that's her. Oh, you I didn't just, know it was. Her. No. you didn't know it was the same girl. No, I didn't know it was the same person. I see. So then, how? What happened then after that? Okay. Um, I meet this girl named Amber Norris in Houston. She says her brother owns this company, and and I could get a job, and right. and we end up. Uh, I go. She has a little car, and I'm going to to to, to Port Arthur. Mm -hmm. Uh, she uh. Uh, has a brother. I stay with him for a little while. I, yeah. I, I put in an application. I get a job as a bartender at a yeah. at a at a club called the uh, 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 the Gulf the Gulf Gulf Way. It's on Gulf yeah. Way Drive. Oh, the Holiday Club. The yeah. Holiday Club. It's a suit and tie club though. And I had an apartment Fifth Street in in Port Arthur, Texas. Mm -hmm. Amber was staying with me. Mm -hmm. And then one day, um, I'm in the club. And these two gentlemen walk in. They're kind of out of place. Yeah. They're dressed in regular civilian-like clothes. Right. No suit and tie. Uh -huh. Long, oily hair. One of them has glasses. The other one is, you know, kind of disheveled, too. They walk up. They sit down at the bar, not at a table, uh -huh. but they sit down at the bar right in front of me. I said, how's it going? Well, uh, what do you have? He says, uh, what kind of beer you have? I tell him about the beer. Yeah. He says, what do you have on tap? No tap. It's in the bottles. I tell him. I don't yeah. remember what they get. But they get two beers. 
and I open them for them, pour half of them each. Anything else? Nope, that's it. And then it's either Cheryl or Pam. Uh, uh, I think it was Pam. And I remember this for the first time in 45 years um, in detail. Um, Pam comes up to the bar. She says, Carrie, uh, Cy, needs, Cy was the manager that I worked for, Cy Kugler. Mm -hmm. She said, Cy needs to see you in the back for a minute. And uh, I was okay. So I, uh, I I exit through the, the you know, as bars have that side door, yeah. that little half saloon-like door. Mm -hmm. You know, I move that back and it locks behind me. And, and I go in the back room, usually well lit, you know, uh, fluorescent lights, those big, long light yeah. bulbs. It's always, it's a kitchen. It's really lit up. It's pitch dark. I step in, mumbling for the light. Sigh, sigh. And all of a sudden, you know, sh sh the, the lights come on at the same time. And I remember it like it was yesterday, the glint of the silver from the light hitting the, the silver Smith & Wesson handcuffs. The sound you were making was handcuffs being put on Yeah, but I, but yeah, I saw the, the light refracted off, off the silver of the handcuffs, you know, that little star thing. Yeah. And it slammed on my wrist. And then he says, my name's Detective Eddie Clark. I'm with the Tyler Police Department. You're under arrest for the capital murder of Linda Edwards. And that was the first time you heard that you were that was, arrested. That was the first time I heard that you were uh, accused. And and then, do you know how long that was after the uh, after August the 5th, 1977? August 5th. So it was two months. Two, two months. months later. Nearly two months later. Nearly two months later. Wow, I just remember that. Yes. Two months nearly later. Nearly two months later. Wow. And so they, they put you in like a car or a van or something? And put, me in the, put me in the back of a, a, a pitch dark. And the windows were pitch dark. It was an undercover police car. Uh -huh. And they drove me to the Port Arthur Police Department. And when they got me there, uh, they interrogated me for hours and hours. Eddie Clark, it, this is what happened. He said to me, he said to me, uh, for example, uh, I kept telling him, I don't know what you, I'm innocent. What do you, I, 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 I don't know her because I didn't remember her. Yeah. So he said, he was angry. He said, what if I stomp a mud hole in you? Will you tell me then? And I was scared to death, uh, but I couldn't do that. I just would look down. I said, look at me. And I looked down. I said, I said man, I, I, can I call my family? Uh, I'm innocent. I, I don't know anything about this. You mm -hmm. got the wrong guy. And he says to me, if you didn't do it, why are your fingerprints all over her body? All and, over her body. And I said, that's not possible. That's not, that's impossible. I'm innocent. Yeah. He said, then if you didn't do it, why is your semen there at the crime scene? And I'm going, that's not possible. Right. I've never had sex with her. Uh, whoever it is, uh, that's not possible. These, 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 these ploys that they were playing, uh, they would have worked on a guilty person. Right. I would have said, yeah, okay, you got me. But I'm fighting against them and saying, I need to talk to my family. You're lying. So at this, at this point, did you know who it was that had been murdered? Still not yet, not yet. Okay. Uh, I don't okay. think I, uh, I, I did learn, uh, uh, before I got in the plane and on the way back to Port Arthur, they, they, uh, the sheriff of Cherokee County, Danny Stallings, had a friend that, that, uh, had a private plane. That's how they came and got me. And I don't know how, but I, I learned, uh, yeah, it would have been some, some inference that they said, well, you, you're lying. You know, you pointed out the window. You told witnesses, and that's when I said, Linda, I didn't remember her last name. Linda, that girl, you know, yeah, that's who they're accusing me of murdering. Wow. That's when I knew. So when my dad, uh, they, they, they put me in the, uh, ch uh, the, the Tyler City Jail, mm -hmm. and uh, they take off all my clothes uh, naked. It's a freezing cell. I mean, it's freezing. Right. And. Uh, I'm exhausted. I haven't slept now in well over 24 hours or eaten. And every time I, I involuntarily pass out on the steel bunk, there's no mattress. Yeah. There's no uh, uh, blanket, just a steel bed. And it's freezing. I'm in a fetal position, you know, and I just finally pass out. Uh, all I know is uh, I wake up to uh, Ron Scott, Detective Ron Scott, yeah. Lieutenant Ron Scott, kicking me away. Get up, get up. You can't sleep. Not until you tell us what we want to know. And so... Uh, short, I don't know how long I'm there, three days, four days. I just know that, uh, uh, I look up and there's my mom and dad. They call me, they rouse me out of a sleep and Carrie, son. And, and there's my mom and dad. 
I run up to the bars. There's a there's a camera, surveillance camera on us yeah. with an angry red eye just staring down at me. I could see it from my bunk and uh, my bed. And uh, my dad, I grab his arm. I grab my mom. I'm so scared. Get me out, please. Get me out. They they're, they're saying they're saying this. They're saying that. They're saying it. My dad says to me, uh, "Son, did did you know this girl that was killed?" And I said, I looked at the light, the camera. And I, I, uh, I leaned in real close. Mm -hmm. I was terrified at that point. So I, I leaned into the bars and I said, yeah, dad, this is the same girl. I met her at the pool and went back to her apartment. My dad says to me, uh, uh, keep your mouth shut. Don't tell anybody you've ever been in that apartment. Right. If you ever tell them you've been in that apartment, Carrie, they're going to say you did it yeah. because of my record. And so, and that really made a lot of sense to me. Yeah. So I never told my defense attorneys, A. Minton Dixon. I never told anybody until you've been in there, yeah. many years later. Right. I told David Hanners for the first time from the Smith County Jail, and I told Jim McCluskey. That was, and then, that was more than 10 years later. It was if more I than 15. Yeah. Let me read a section from your, your book right about this point. I think this is the time that, um, uh, that you are um, uh, about to be uh, charged there for the first time. Uh, the moment the doors opened, the media lights exploded into a brilliant, blinding light. I held my hand up to shield my eyes to lessen the stabbing pain. The reporters were shouting at me to be heard over the den of one another. The jailer and I passed a cluster of, report a cluster of reporters and photographers circled around a man in a dark suit named A.D. Clark III. He was the Smith County District Attorney. Clark had been appointed by Texas Governor Dolph Briscoe to fill the unexpired term of Curtis Owen, who had resigned in March of 1976 to run for a district judge position. Clark himself was running in the November election to keep the district attorney position, and he had just found the perfect case to raise his profile. As we walked past, I heard him declare to the media, quote, I will personally try this case, and I intend to prove Carrie Max Cook raped and killed Linda Jo Edwards on a murderous rampage. Another thing I noticed noted here was that this was the first capital murder case in that county since 1935. So this I, was big news there. I didn't remember writing that, but yes, okay. No, you're, you're going back to the Bonnie and Clyde days before, you know. And they said it was one of the first capital murder cases uh, in Texas since the United States Supreme Court Right. And reinstated capital punishment in Furman versus Georgia, or Greg versus Georgia. Greg versus Georgia. So I was one of the first uh, capital murder cases where the death penalty could be sought. When there is a murder in a small town, the police are under a lot of pressure to solve it quickly. In this case, it appears that they felt they had their suspect when Carrie's fingerprints were found on the apartment sliding glass door. This was the first murder case in that county since 1935. Now, in 1968, States in the United States suspended use of the death penalty pending the result of Furman versus Georgia, a case that, was, a case that was going to the Supreme Court. In 1972, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that states had to rewrite their capital murder statutes to do away with inconsistencies. Texas reinstated the death penalty in 1977, the year of this case. So one of the key points of the, of the county's case against you and there were there were many of them, multiple sham pieces, but one was those fingerprints you talked about. Right. There was a an expert that said he could gauge the age of the fingerprints that they were there, uh, just a certain amount of time. Uh, what came about from that? Okay. Well, uh, as some of you know from watching TV crime shows or Leah or, yeah. or, or with a true crime podcast in America, before you can be arrested of a crime. Uh, they give an affidavit. The police officer lead detective uh, gives an affidavit in which uh, to a judge that says uh, this is the probable cause. I swear that this is the yeah. so-called evidence and this is probable cause that Steve Meeker or Philip or Leah committed this crime. Right. So say it, the affiant. Uh, probable and, cause. And yeah. It's a probable cause. Well, in my case, uh, Doug Collard, uh, who was with uh, you, you said it. The identification division of the Tyler Police Department, Sergeant Doug Collard, he said that the um, uh, the fingerprint he found on the outside of the patio door 
was, quote, unquote, the killer's calling card. Uh -huh. And then shored that up by saying the only time that fingerprint could have been left was at the exact time of the murder. But he said it's six to 12 hours. But you back up six to 12 hours. The pathologist changed this, the time of death and moved it up to two hours. I and see. Then Paula so to Rudolph, fit into their little uh, and, slump. And Paula Rudolph completely changed her testimony in, in time for me to be the new person she was identifying and not right. James Mayfield. So... This, this affidavit that, that we sent Leah uh, that was a probable cause that got me arrested, if, if, you, if she asked me about it, she's got it. Those, those points he's using that gets me arrested, I can prove to you absolutely unequivocally with documents, yeah. court documents, yeah. court of criminal appeals reversals of my conviction. It was all false. Right. Well, it's the, you, you, there's no way to tell how old a fingerprint is. And by the way. That's I'm what he was claiming he could tell. He and, aged it to say that it was 8 to 12 hours Right. Old and at the time. And here's the thing. It. Here's the thing. Many years later, I was close to being executed at the time. Yeah. Many years later, um, he uh, he was applying to get certification. His entire knowledge of the art of fingerprints at the time was a six months correspondence course. Right. So by this time, he was trying to be certified and he went to the International Association for Identifiers. That's a fingerprinting licensing board. Right. And at the time, the Dallas Morning News had done a series of front page stories. And one of them was key evidence in Cook case said to be false. Right. That the fingerprint, there's no way to age a fingerprint. That's this right. is false. So somebody with the uh, international identification for identifiers saw, read that Dallas Morning News stories, and he was a member mm -hmm. and filed a complaint against them. Right. Well, Doug Collard answers the complaint, and he says he shouldn't be held accountable. He knows it was perjury, and he shouldn't be held accountable. He said, I only did so at the behest of the district attorney's office, A.D. Clark III. He said he continually, for whether it was the indictment, the grand jury, yeah. uh, or the trial, he said before testifying, he would he would – Reiterate to the to the DA Clark that this is I can't substan I can't substantiate right. this I can't say this and he said at all times he was met quote unquote with strong resistance and so yeah. but what was the resistance when I got retrials he did the same thing in retrials yeah. with a whole new different DA the new DA at that time was A.D. Clark's first cousin Jack Skeens their mothers wow. were yeah their okay. first cousins. Affiant has been informed by Sergeant Doug Collard of the Identification Division of the Tyler Police Department that he lifted latent fingerprints from a sliding glass door at the rear of the scene of the crime. Sergeant Collard made a comparison on August 3rd, 1977, between these latent fingerprints with fingerprints known to those of Carrie Max Cook obtained from the Jacksonville, Texas Police Department. Sergeant Collard stated to Affiant that the fingerprints found at the scene were identical to those of Carrie Max Cook, as shown on the Jacksonville Police Department fingerprint card. Sergeant, Sergeant Collard stated to Affiant in, this, in his opinion, and I'm just going to stop for a minute and say that Affiant is the arresting officer. This right. is reading from an affidavit that's uh, stating probable cause for arrest. Okay, so... Sergeant Collard stated to Affiant, in his opinion, the latent fingerprints were 8 to 12 hours old at the time he lifted them, which was 9 a.m. on June 10, 1977. And we will, we will talk about that a little bit more later. Let me ask you about something else in your trial. Shyster Jackson, who was that? Shyster Jackson was 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 a a, a a veteran of crime from one end of the nation to the next. He was a hustler. Uh -huh. uh, his 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 street name was Shyster, but his real name was Edward Scott Jackson. Uh -huh. um, he uh, uh, he I, he claimed that uh, I was held in solitary confinement from the moment they arrested me and transferred me from the Tyler City Jail to the Smith County Jail. Right. I was thrown in a dark solitary confinement, a five by nine cell. They called it the side cell. It was for unruly prisoners. Yeah. But with me, because I was charged with this murder and they were trying to break me uh, in every, every which way they could. So uh, I never see anybody, just my dad once every other week because he yeah. couldn't afford to take off. And only then five minutes, they'd open up a little portal yeah. and I'd be able to talk to him. I cried most of the time, Daddy, get me out. Daddy, get me out. Yeah. I'm so scared and, you know, uh, didn't see him much. So uh, he says, son, just wait till you get the trial. It's going to be over. You're going to come home with this. Yeah. Just just not much longer. The lawyers say maybe next month, maybe, maybe in June. Yeah. And so I go to trial a year later and they, they say, Next, we want to call to the stand 
Edward Scott Jackson. Oh, yeah, and they wouldn't let you call him Shyster Jackson. No, either. they wouldn't. They said... that was, it, Even though that was his nickname that he was well known by that. We had to call him by his Christian name. Yeah. And here is this guy who's, you know, he takes the witness stand. He's in his, he's in, he's in his Smith County Jail uh, uniform, you know? Right. And, and he says, he talks about, uh, yeah, we're in a cell together, and uh, I'm looking at uh, a penthouse or Playboy. Any girl that has dark hair, because Linda had dark hair, yeah. he said, he said... Can I say the words he said, or is, is it? It's profanity. Go ahead. He said, "This bitch needs to die. Kill her. Kill her. This bitch has to die." He said, "That's what he heard you say." That's what he Clint told the jury that I said. And then he said one of the most remarkable things that could have that did come from all of it came from the prosecution, but this was really clearly subordination of perjury. He says because at this point. It's clear Paula Rudolph saw James Mayfield. She identified him to a T yeah. in every which way, uh, even all, all the way down to what he was wearing, the, right. uh, the white tennis shorts. Well, she, he tells the jury. Uh, so what else did he say, to, uh, Jackson? Tell, tell the jury. He said that he uh, he just got back from an examining trial hearing, and the eyewitnesses is talking about she saw a man named James Mayfield. He's off the hook. He was bragging that, hey, man, I'm off the hook. She says she saw someone else. So this guy says this to the court, even though you'd never seen him before. And that was very... But they're presenting him as the guy that you saw in, in, and here, in prison. And here is Michael Thompson, the prosecutor, in closing arguments. I submit to you, I know this is an inmate. I'm going to be cr screaming for his head, uh, and it will fall soon because he's in jail for murder yeah. as soon as this guy is over. And he says... Uh, uh, there's no deals made. Uh, he's going to, he's going to go to prison too, but he says there, there, there aren't any, no deals have been made. And he said, I want you to keep this in mind. Yeah. He's a murderer. Shyster, uh, Jackson's a murderer, but he told us things only the real killer would have known. Uh -huh. Think about it. Yeah. How did he know? How did Jackson know? Well, fast forward 20 years later, he tells Geraldo Rivera, uh, on a special episode of, NBC that they showed him the murder. I've got that video. Yeah. He, uh, I've got that. He says they showed him the murder pictures, told him what to testify to and said, if, he, if I got convicted, they would set him free. And that's exactly what they did. But they still deny yeah. making that deal. Yes. John Grisham said when he yeah. read my book, he said, if it were fiction, no one would believe it. Right. Chester Jackson claimed that he heard Carrie admit to the crime when they shared a jail cell. Yet Carrie claims that he was in solitary confinement the whole time. He was in the Smith County Jail. His legal team requested a copy of the records for where prisoners were held. The page detailing Carey's cell was strangely missing. The jailer was suddenly on vacation and unable to testify. The jury believed Jackson's testimony, and Carey was convicted of Linda Joe Edwards' rape and murder. He was sentenced to die by lethal injection. Let's go now to the point you've been convicted you arrive on death row. Can I, re can I read a little bit from your book? Yeah, please do. Okay. So it's your first day on death row. And you uh, you get your cell. You, you sell, you're hollering out to the inmates, Hi, my name is Carrie. I just got here. How do I get sheets and pillows? It's pretty nasty. Somebody yells from above, This isn't the Holiday Inn, man. See the concierge. And they start laughing. Ignore the idiots. The fellow next to you says, uh, Bird, Jerry, Jerry Joe Bird. Jerry Joe. Another voice from somewhere above me says, and I'm Alton, Alton Bird, no relation. I'm in 19 cell above you. Oh, wow. And you said, God, I just, uh, I'm just glad I won't have to be here long. I replied, well, yeah, where are you going? Jerry Joe Bird says worthlessly. I got railroaded. I'm innocent. I'm not, I'm going to be getting out of here soon. They violated the Speedy Trial Act by not giving me 120 days. Heck, my lawyers had to file a second one to remind them to act on the first. My lawyer said it's merely a question of filing my brief and getting the ruling from the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals in Austin. That's it. Adios, amigos, I said with confidence. The wing of 50 or so prisoners erupted in laughter. Yes. Jerry continued, uh, you're going to find out the hard way. It's not about your guilt or innocence any longer, dude. The whole process from this moment on is about whether you were given a fair trial. The burden of proof is completely on you now. That's the total, that's the legal standard. Then I'm in much better shape than I thought because I know my trial was a sham. It was anything but fair. Are you deaf? Jerry said in an almost fatherly way. I didn't say the burden of knowledge uh, was on you. I said the burden of proof. Mm. Were you listening to anything I told you? Knowing in the abstract, 
And proving and the met material are two different things. You'll come to learn that. There were guys that I met on death row that I'm thinking, you know, they're no right. different than Phil, Phil or you sitting across yeah. from me, but they're convicted of, of, of some pretty bad crimes. But you could tell the people that were convicted of bad crime. It, it was either police officer murdered. So they didn't have all that illness. They were right. scary people and whatever happened, but you could always, uh, I could always tell the sex offenders. They yeah. were different. They had a look, different look. Yeah, a different I, I, look. I noticed that too when I was teaching in the prison. You, you, you could tell almost that uh, people that had committed a murder were the most normal-looking people in a lot of ways. They weren't the lifetime criminals necessarily. You know. Yeah. They were, often they were white-collar, you know, yeah. professional people. You know. So. Yes, and the ones that were there for pedophilia or, or murdering women, right. there's just something that just warns you to stay away from. Be careful. Yeah. Because I was a rape victim. I mean, I was traumatized by the inmates. So I, right. I, I, I learned to study offenders. That's how I came to protect myself. I could spot one a million miles away. Most of us, the only way we know anything about prison or what it's like in prison is from movies. Movies, movies and, and TV. How is it different? Tell us how, how it's, it's different. How is it different? It's it's as it's as it's as different as daylight to darkness. The 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 TV series. I won't watch those series and those movies. Shawshank Redemption, so forth. But uh, like Oz, I, I when I first got out, I started watching that Showtime Oz. It's it, it's completely ridiculous. It, it it it's satirical almost. It's the reality of prison. It's not like it's depicted in books and movies. It, 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 it's, it's false. And, it, and no wonder kids, before they go, think it's a rite of pa passage to go to prison. I tell mm -hmm. these kids, look, you cannot trust what you're watching on TV, Showtime, HBO, or the movie theater. It's not like that in reality. The only thing that's really real in, in, in those movies is when you see two or three guys coming at you, shirtless tattoos all over them, headbands on, with knives stabbing you to death. Now that's real. That happens all the time. The reality in being raped, where where they tell the younger kid, you know, uh, they're punking them out. What they call call it. Prison is a very phallocentric society, and there is no God there. The meek does not inherit the earth there. In prison, only the strong survive. The strongest is the strong. You have to be willing to take someone's life. Respect is everything. Once someone disrespects you or takes advantage of you, you have to kill them. Otherwise, you're considered a punk. You're considered weak. Right. And what that means, Leah, that's when they come for you. And they don't allow you to stand up because they're going to kill you. Hey, man, you let such and such, you gave it up. You gave it up. Or you let him hog you. That's the phrase they use when they take something from you. It belongs, you, it belongs to you, like your commissary or your booty. They call it hogging you. Mm -hmm. So once someone hogs you and you don't do nothing about it, like stab them, then you can't stand up anymore. They'll kill you. They're, they're going to make you. They're, they're going to they're gonna make you. Uh, endure sexual slavery. Yet you and, found yourself, you couldn't fight back because you didn't want that to reflect back to your appeal. Like, oh, see, he's just a fighter. He killed somebody in prison. See, he's already a murderer. We already knew it all along. You couldn't do any of that. You couldn't fight back, right? And you know, that, that, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's really, uh, something that you say that because, uh, I, I endured it because I thought, uh, the Court of Criminal Appeals is going to, See through the the mirage, the the, the false things that convicted me. It was right. so so clear. Uh, uh, Ronnie Millsap could have seen through it, right. and so uh, I endured it. I let him, I let him do those horrible horrible things to me because I thought, you know what, I'm going to go back home to Doorway, my mom and my dad. Uh, I just got to survive. Yeah. I just got to stay alive. I got to figure out a way to stay alive. This helps me stay alive. And Carrie, one day it'll be over. You'll get out. And you'll forgive yourself. Right. After being convicted of Linda Jo Edwards' rape and murder, Kerry finds himself on death row at the Ellis One unit of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice near Huntsville, Texas. His attorney, Harry Hurd, told Kerry that he would get him out. For the next eight years, he languished on death row, waiting for the te Texas Court of Criminal Appeals to act. In 1987, they did act, but it wasn't in Kerry's favor. We're going to close part one of this interview now. Please be watching for part two coming soon, where we will hear Kerry Max Cook tell the rest of his amazing but horrific story. Phil here reminding you to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Remnants2Podcast. Drop us an email 
at staycurious at remnants2.com just to say hi or to let us know about any topics you would like to hear us cover in an upcoming episode. Remnant Stew is created by me, Leah Lamb, and is now part of Rook and Raven Ventures. Dr. Stephen Meeker and I research, write, and host each episode, along with commentary by our audio producer, Philip Sinkfeld. Theme music is by Kevin McLeod, with voiceover by Morgan Hughes. We especially thank Carrie Cook and his wife, Sandra, for coming into the studio and sharing Carrie's story with us. Before you go, please hit the follow button so you won't miss an episode. Head over to Apple Music and leave us a review. Share Remnant Stew with your friends and family. Until next time, remember to choose to be kind and And always always stay stay curious. curious.